Cynicism masquerades as wisdom, but it is the farthest thing from it because cynics don't learn anything because cynicism is a self-imposed blindness, a rejection of the world because we are afraid it will hurt us or disappoint us. Cynics always say no, but saying yes begins things. Saying yes is how things grow. Saying yes leads to knowledge. So for as long as you have the strength to, say yes. Let's imagine two people who are roughly the same age, with the same income, and the same level of education. Let's call them Karen and Stacy. Karen goes to the doctor for a routine checkup, but she tends to be a bit of a pessimist. In most situations, she focuses on all the ways that things might go wrong, and all of the worst elements of her problems. She complains a lot. When she sees her doctor, she's visibly annoyed and angry at having to wait. Because of this, the doctor tries to rush through the appointment, and she misses an important diagnosis that she otherwise would have made. The next time she goes to the doctor, they dread the appointment, and they keep her sitting in the waiting room for as long as possible. And when they do see her, they try to rush her through the appointment as quickly as they can. This has negative effects on Karen's health. She gets sick more often. She misses more work and has less energy, which in turn affects her career, her relationships, and creates a downward spiral of negativity. On the other hand, Stacy goes to the doctor for the same routine checkup. But Stacy has a positive outlook on life. In every difficulty, she notices opportunities that other people miss. She takes advantage of them. When she sees her doctor, she's bright and cheerful. Her doctor enjoys their appointments. In fact, Stacy is a breath of fresh air in a hospital that's often cold and filled with patients that are unhappy and feeling pain. And so the doctor takes extra time to explain information to Stacy in detail so that nothing gets missed. Stacy has a long and joyful life where her positive mindset boosts her health and relationships. This gives her more energy to be productive in her career, which creates an upward spiral of positivity. Why does this happen? Psychologist Richard Wiseman has said that expectations play an absolutely vital role in explaining why some people obtain their dreams with uncanny ease, while other people rarely get what they want from life. This is the basic insight captured in the Law of Attraction, that your thoughts have tremendous power, that whatever you focus on expands. In my previous video, we looked at four objections to James Janney's argument against the Law of Attraction. If you haven't seen it yet, you can watch it here. And it has to be said that the point of all this is not to incite any kind of harassment against James Janney or anyone else. The point is to present a balance of ideas, because as we'll see, I believe that James Janney presents a very one-sided case, and there are a number of inconsistencies in his logic and reasoning. So with that said, let's get into it. James Janney says several times that the law of attraction is unfalsifiable, but what exactly is falsifiability? This idea can be traced to a philosopher named Karl Popper, who published this concept in his book The Logic of Scientific Discovery in 1959. Popper argued that it must be possible to prove a scientific theory wrong through experiment or observation, and if you can't prove it wrong, then he considers it to be a pseudoscience. But here's the problem. Not all scientists agree with Popper on this, and the idea of falsifiability has been challenged by many different scholars. For example, Willard Quine and Pierre Duhem point out that in practice, scientists can't actually use falsifiability as a real criterion because it's impossible to test the validity of a single hypothesis on its own without calling into question the entire theory as a whole. And in fact, many scientific theories can't be falsified in the sense that Popper describes. As this article points out, one of the best examples of this comes from string theory. String theory is the idea that the basic building blocks of everything we find in the universe is made up of tiny vibrating strands of energy, called strings. And depending on how they vibrate, they form the atoms of all the things we see all around us. So in a very real sense, we are all in a state of vibration. Here's the problem. String theory is widely considered to be unfalsifiable, and yet many scientists still support it as an accurate model of reality. Professor Sean Carroll, a physicist at Caltech, has argued that falsifiability 
is just a simple motto that non-philosophically trained scientists have latched onto. And he says that in practice, falsifiability is not a good way to tell apart science from non-science. But perhaps most damaging is the fact that philosopher John Gray points out that if we accepted Popper's account of falsifiability, then it would have prevented the theories of Charles Darwin and Albert Einstein from being accepted as science as well. So if scientists don't even trust falsifiability as a useful concept, then why should we accept James Janney's conclusion here, given that his whole argument rests on this faulty premise? James Janney argues that in every example where the law of attraction seems to have worked, it's just a coincidence because of something called the Bader-Meinhof effect. For those who don't know, the Bader-Meinhof effect happens when, after noticing something for the first time, we tend to notice it much more often. For example, if you buy a white car, you might find that all of a sudden you start noticing many white cars. But to explain this, James uses a bizarre example involving apples. Take, for example, an apple. Let me ask you, while watching this video, how many instances did you notice the image of an apple or the word apple? The problem with this is that all he's really done is he's purposely contrived an example where he hides a bunch of apples in a video and then reveals that they were hidden. This doesn't prove or disprove anything. Of course, what he's trying to argue is that every example of manifestation is really just a coincidence that comes from our tendency to notice things more often because of the Bader-Meinhof effect. But he's making at least two questionable assumptions. First, he's assuming that it's valid to generalize from one specific example that he made up to conclude that therefore every instance of manifestation that happens in the world is also just a coincidence. And second, James assumes that the Bader-Meinhof effect and manifestation are inconsistent with each other, but they're not. Pessimistic people often say things like, nothing good ever happens to me, even when objectively, good things do happen to them, but they fixate on the negatives anyway. And optimistic people will often say that wonderful things happen to me all the time, even when they've suffered tremendous loss and heartbreak, because they look to find gratitude for all the blessings in their lives. Over the course of a lifetime, having these mindsets builds on themselves in a powerful way. Remember, the Bader-Meinhof effect has been described as a kind of selective attention, which makes us notice things more often when we pay attention to them. And studies like this one show us that selective attention supports the positivity effects we see, for example, in aging. It also suggests that focusing on positives and ignoring negative information as we age could lead to more resilience and emotional health as we get older. And we can see this in this 2009 study of more than 97,000 women, which showed that people who had the most pessimistic and cynical attitudes had significantly higher rates of heart disease, cancer, and mortality compared to women with more optimistic attitudes. And these findings aren't just correlation. Many studies show that optimism is also a predictor of how healthy you're likely to become in the future. Not only does James Janney ignore all of this research, he never explains why he assumes that the Bader-Meinhof effect and manifestation are inconsistent with each other. James Janney is also very critical of a water experiment carried out by Dr. Masuro Emoto. For those who don't know, in this experiment, Dr. Emoto put water into different containers, and then he spoke positive or negative phrases into them. He then froze the water, and he found that when the phrase was positive, the water crystals looked beautiful. But if the phrase was negative, the water crystals looked disfigured and chaotic. James Janney attacks the study on the basis that other scientists had a hard time repeating these results. Here's the thing. It's actually not at all unique to this water study. It's a widespread problem for the sciences as a whole, and it's been found that many scientific studies are difficult, if not impossible, to reproduce. And it's so common that it has a name. It's called the replication crisis, and it's an ongoing problem in many areas of science, including medicine. Which brings us to the second problem. James Janney attacks the water experiment on the basis of Dr. Emoto's credentials. He elaborates on this here. Dr. Emoto himself is technically not a doctor. He is a doctor of alternative medicine at the Open International University for Alternative Medicine in India. But this is a logical mistake known as the credentials fallacy. 
This fallacy happens when someone dismisses an argument simply because the person doesn't have the right credentials or doesn't have credentials that are considered good enough. And it's a fallacy because whether or not someone has the right credentials doesn't automatically invalidate what they say. The reasonable way to critique an argument is to analyze the actual content of what someone is saying, not to attack the person for not having the right letters after their name. And that's important because many scientific discoveries have been made by non-scientists and by regular people without any formal credentials. James Janney has an issue with the law of attraction using words like law and quantum. But in my opinion, this is really just a semantic issue that doesn't really go anywhere. Many people, for example, talk about the law of karma, which is meant to be a spiritual concept. Another article mentions the 12 spiritual laws of the universe, which again is a spiritual idea. Many critics argue that the law of attraction is wrong because having a positive outlook on life doesn't give you positive outcomes 100% of the time. But this is a silly requirement. Many drugs and medicines don't even work 100% of the time, and yet they're prescribed every day. What it seems to boil down to is that James and other skeptics don't like the use of the word law. But if we change the name from the law of attraction to, for example, something like the mindset of attraction, would that really change anything? It doesn't disprove manifestation. It doesn't change any of the central claims. All it does is change the name. And this is a sign that we're now dealing with a purely semantic argument. But these are all just symptoms of a larger issue. In the closing moments of his video, The Dark World of New Age Gurus, James talks about the importance of critical thinking. Be wary of an industry that uses unfalsifiable claims and an unimaginable amount of pseudoscience to generate millions in revenue. Critical thinking is a skill and it should be honed and practiced. The irony, of course, is that James himself has made a number of mistakes in critical thinking, from the questionable assumptions he makes to his use of the credentials fallacy. In my first video, we saw how Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis was a victim of institutional cynicism and how his discovery was completely ignored because of the scientific prejudices of his time. Many things have changed since then, but still, this underlying cynicism remains. But it doesn't have to. One of the best examples of this comes from Jack Layton, a Canadian political leader who died from cancer. Before he died, he wrote these final words. My friends, love is better than anger. Hope is better than fear. Optimism is better than despair. So let's be loving, hopeful, and optimistic, and we'll change the world. Jack died believing in the inherent goodness of people, and for that reason, he's one of my personal heroes. So let's be kind out there, everyone. And if you like this video, then I think you'll enjoy this video on the myths of success. Please show your support by hitting the like button. It helps me to bring more content like this to you. As always, thanks so much for watching. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you in the next video.